1766. So these elements are coming up and along. I can keep going. This is 1869, t starting to take shape. And so just giving a sense that you can play with this diagram. Now what I'm going to do now is put the flag of the country that discovered each element. Okay? So let's check out what that looks like. Ooh. That's kind of cool. Okay, notice the right-hand column. You see the Union Jack there, very proud column in the UK. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. This line of elements are the noble gases. Do you know why they're called noble gases? Because the British discovered them, <laughs> and they learned that these elements don't combine with any other. And in their social structures, the noble class does not associate with any other. It's little facts like that that reminds me of why we fought a war to get out of England. <laughs> their culture is writ on the iconography of the periodic table of elements, the noble gases. Well, America is nowhere to be found up there because we weren't even a country when most of these elements were founded. But when we did become a country and Congress knew that physics, which specializes in matter, motion, and energy, might matter for war, particle accelerators were funded without limit. And it's out of these particle accelerators that we then take out the top end of the periodic table. That's where all of these came from. This is Germany discovered ur uranium. It's named after the planet Uranus, an element discovered shortly after the planet was in the sky. They knew that's an important, elements are important, so they want to name him something cosmic, Uranus. Neptunium, guess who that's named after? Neptune. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> P-U, <laughs> plutonium. Pluto gets discovered in 1930. This element gets discovered in 1940. It's right in line with Uranus-Neptune. They name it Pluto on the false pretense that it was a bona fide planet. <laughs> Pluto got on there on false pretense. But, so, but look at this. We discover all these, so we get to name them. This is... Americium, named after America. This is, this is Californium. This is Berkelium, right? These, these, are particle excel, these are places where you have particle accelerators discovering elements. It's naming rights. Other naming rights, let's go back a little bit. September 11th, 2001, day we all remember, uh, I was this happened four blocks from my residence. These are uh, camcorder shots from my window. This is the North Tower uh, on fire. The South Tower had just been hit about a 20th of a second before this frame was taken. You can see a piece of it punching out and the shadow of that. This is before the atomized fuel ignited, so it's really just the kinetic energy of the ship coming through. If you've never been to New York, just so you understand, this black building on the left is a 50-story hotel, all right? And the towers are 107 stories each. Why am I showing you this? Well, let me just get through it first. So the, the jet fuel ignites, creates a deflagration wave, and there it is engulfing the entire, and that's the, the remnants of the plane and people and everything else, office furniture coming out the side. Within an hour of that, uh, the towers are just gone, all right? And this is the dust cloud that came after it. So this is the street on which I live. So this is 65 minutes after it collapsed. And so, so this is going on. Shortly after this, President Bush, in an attempt to sort of distinguish we from they, utters the following sentence. And this was 
before I was on his Rolodex, so I could have helped him out here, you know. I could have said, no, don't say that, okay? So he says, with loose quoting of biblical Genesis, he says, our God is the God who named the stars. Now, first of all, it's the same God, okay? God of Islam and God of the Old Testament. It's the same, Allah is the same as the God of the, it's the same. So hold that aside for the moment. Hold that aside. What he did not know is that of all stars that have names, two thirds of them have Arabic star names, okay? Now, I don't think that's the point he wanted to make. I think he, 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 he didn't quite get that. And so, he, you know, here they go. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. Not all stars have names, but two thirds of those that do have names have Arabic names. There we go, okay? There they go. And you might say, well, how did this come to pass? What, where did that come from? What was going on? Because if you think of the Middle East now, and it's not where, you're not saying, hey, these are folks naming stars. You go back a thousand years, Islam, 800 to 1100. In that period, which is generally called the golden age of Islam, of Islamic science, golden age, true, go there was no greater golden age in the history of the world before or after. When you look at the sum of advances that came out of that period in Baghdad, algebra was invented in that period. Algebra is itself an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. Our numerals are Arabic numerals. You ever wonder why? You ever stop and think why they're called Arabic numerals? In that period, mathematics took great leaps and bounds. Agriculture, engineering, medicine, navigation. 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 Star maps were made to assist navigation. Astrolabes were, were crafted. Then it all stopped. It ended. It ended. If you're a historian, typically you are, you're, you, are, you focus on history as marked by changes of kings and leaders and wars. That's the lens through which many historians look at the past. And so if you ask people, they'll say, oh, the Mongols sacked Baghdad, and so that's why it all ended. If that were the only force operating, then later, when the Islamic culture rose, you would still see this tradition of scientific um, uh, uh, innovation. But it has not recovered. It has not come back at all compared to what was going on in that 300 years. And what you do is you, you read the writings of al-Ghazali, who is a, a Muslim cleric, and he, he was to Islam what St. Augustine was to Christianity. What he did was he taught you how to be a good Muslim. He taught you how to read the Quran and how to obey the commands. That, because back then, people were just interpreting it for themselves. He came along. He was a, an academic scholar. He interpreted the Quran. He said, this is how you must do it. First has social influence and then political and cultural influence. And basically, his interpretation took over. And in that interpretation, it included the perspective that the manipulation of numbers is the work of the devil. This cuts the kneecaps out of any mathematical advances that would unfold. Math is the language of the universe. If you take that out of your personal equation, you no longer contribute to the advance of human understanding of that universe. And that absence of Muslim presence in the frontier of science persists to this day. Take a look at the Nobel Prize from 1900 to 2010. I can do this, do this for the, for the Jews, for example. How many Jews in the world? There's like 15 million tops, tops, 15 million out of seven billion people. These are the numbers of Jews who have won the Nobel Prize in the Sciences. 